Hi guys, welcome to Tuesday at 5.05. Sorry, I'm a couple minutes late. I was trying to kick Lisa out of the office. She was being slow as usual, but hey, not her fault. So I'm she's sorry. gone now, um, and we're going to talk about a recent episode of 60 Minutes. It aired Sunday night. If you've not had time to watch it, um, I put the link yesterday in a post uh, inviting you to listen to this and so I would encourage you to maybe go watch it so you can hear what I what I'm saying and um, I've made notes and this might tell you how passionate I feel about this is uh, I made four pages of notes listening to this short little story because I think there were some really good things about this um, airing on TV and some things that are not really good and I'm gonna try not to make this too preachy or ranty, um, but I think there's some very important points to consider. So first off, I am thrilled that 60 Minutes is bringing exposure to obesity and the diagnosis of obesity. Uh, it is a huge problem. It is an epidemic in this country. It is slowly killing us in this country and in worldwide, um, but in America, especially this number is on the rise. And so I'm very grateful that they are bringing exposure to this uh, and putting it out there. So that I'm happy about. Uh, they also had two ladies featured in this, two patients um, suffering from obesity in this story. And I love that they put a face to the disease. Um, they, it makes, you, makes others see, hey, this is regular people, everyday people that are really struggling and it can validify feelings that you may be having about obesity. And one of the points that the ladies made is they felt like obesity was a character flaw and they had this misconception that obesity was a character flaw, that it was all their fault until they went to see an obesity specialist. Um, and that, that kind of breaks my heart because in no way um, is obesity a character flaw. It may be a lot of things, but it is not a character flaw. It is not a lack of willpower. Um, the patients that I treat with obesity are some of the kindest, hardest working individuals that I know. And it is not by choice that they came to be obese or that they continue to be obese. Um, it, there's a lot of different things that go into it. We'll get into some of that today, but it is not a character flaw and it is not a lack of willpower. You're not a weak or bad person because you struggle with obesity. And this story did highlight that and that I think is a big thing. Uh, the story also highlighted that there's a huge bias concerning obesity, and I 100% agree with that, um, that there is a, an idea that is thought of when someone is obese as sometimes being lazy or um, unwell or a bad person or something, and, and so there's that huge bias, but that bias also transfers into healthcare. Um, most providers in healthcare do not fully understand obesity. They pointed that out in the story and I 100% agree with that. Um, most providers are not taught about obesity in med school. They're taught about all the complications like diabetes and hypertension and all these other things, but not specifically taught obesity and they are not taught that it's a disease and they are not taught how to treat it. In fact, I mean, I went to a very prestigious nurse practitioner school, but I had to go and get my own training on obesity and I have multiple other certifications, postgraduate certifications in obesity to learn about this because I wasn't taught about it in school. So I do agree there is a large bias in the general community at large, but also in the healthcare community. Um, a lot in the healthcare community just think, oh, patients don't listen to me, they don't do what I tell, They're, they just need to eat less and move more. Um, and that's, that's a huge bias because that's not necessarily the, the truth. And we need to do a better job of educating providers that. Uh, the article or the, that segment had a had information about a specific obesity drug. Uh, and the obesity drug that they pointed out with, by the name is Wegovy. Um, many of the people who come here are probably familiar with that drug. And the things they pointed out that I 100% agree with is yes, it is an FDA approved medication. It is one of the most powerful FDA approved medications that we have to treat obesity. Uh, it costs in this country about $1,300 a month if you're paying cash for it, so it's super expensive. In other countries, it doesn't cost that much, so that uh, says something about our healthcare system here in the U.S. 
There is currently a supply shortage. Yes, that is 100% true. There's been a supply shortage of it since, I think, April of 2022. There is also a law that prevents patients with Medicare um, from having access to any anti-obesity medicine, not just Wegovy, but any anti-obesity medicine is not covered by Medicare. That is truth. Um, I think it's very unfortunate. I think everybody should have access to obesity medications should they choose that that's part of their plan. Uh, but specifically in Medicare, it, there's a law that prevents them from, um, or that allows them to not pay for the drug. Also, many commercial insurances consider Wegovy and medicines alike to be vanity drugs and putting them in the same category as plastic surgery, which I think is ridiculous because they are not vanity drugs. Obesity is a disease. Obesity is um, a chronic problem that needs to be addressed and the medication should be part of the toolbox as an option for patients. Um, they pointed out in this segment that providers are frustrated that we have tools to give patients and we can't get them access to it due to cost and insurance coverage, and that is very, very true. Um, they also pointed out that, and correctly so, and I have a whole other video talking about this and the pros and cons of medications for weight loss, that most patients who go on these medicines, specifically Wegovy, will need to be on that drug indefinitely. And that is because if you stop it, it's basically doing something in the body that is inducing weight loss. If you stop it, then it is that effect is not gonna be there. And so you're going to need to stay on that to achieve that effect. They um, pointed out that one of the main theories of obesity is an evolutionary theory of obesity. <clears throat> The idea is that obesity was created or came about in effort to save us from famine. And I can get on board with this one because it makes sense with the hormonal changes. So your body wants to do every single thing it can to survive. And in the history of humanity, there has been multiple famines or times when we have had a lack of food. So what our bodies have been trained to do over time is when there is an abundance of foods, the hormones rev up and tell us it's time to store body fat. And when there's an absence of food, it, the hormones go down and um, our body's metabolism goes down so that we can slow and preserve ourselves. So obesity is basically your body's in that overdrive saying there's an abundance of food, there's no famine, but I need to store it away because I never know when that time is going to come, when I am going to need food and don't have it and need to have that extra fat. So that I can agree on. But that's where I diverge from, from this article. And some of these things may surprise you that I diverge on, um, that hopefully you'll agree with me on some or at least see my, my point on them. So one thing they said is that the lack of Wegovy, that medicine that cost a tremendous amount of money, is predominantly due to skinny people in Hollywood taking it when they are not supposed to, when they don't need it, when they are not overweight or don't struggle with weights essentially making it the haves can access the medicine and the have-nots cannot access the medicine. Well, I have two things to say about that. One is, one, let's be a little reasonable. This is a worldwide shortage. Um, if all the have-nots, and trust me, not all the haves are gonna wanna take this medicine because of the side effects, but even if all of them had a prescription of the medicine, that's only a small fragment of the population that is going to take this drug. So it just doesn't make numbers to numbers sense that they are the sole cause of the shortage. Um, the other thing is I, I, I as a provider have been firsthand wa watching this shortage happen. So last year in early 2020, Novo Nordisk came out with Wegovy and they had an amazing copay card that went along with it. And it said that anyone, regardless of their insurance coverage, regardless if their insurance was going to cover Wegovy or not, could receive the medication for six months at $25 a month. Essentially leveling the playing field across the board and then giving everybody who wanted to be on that medicine, except for Medicaid and Medicare persons, they can't use copay cards too, another way that those um, insurance companies screw their patients a little bit, um, but it gave everybody access to it for $25 a month. Due to the problem of obesity and how big of an issue it is and how many people desperately want help and how many people have tried and failed in the past, there was an overwhelming response for this drug. Huge overwhelming response. It was being written like crazy and rightly so if it was affordable to patients. But um, then 
within one to two months of it being out, the pen that they put it in, the device that they put it in, was showing malfunctions. The medicine was fine, but the device was malfunctioning. It was shooting medicine in the air instead of in the body. It was shooting it, you know, people would inject thinking it goes in, pulls back, and here goes the medicine across the room. Well, Novo Nordisk said, hold up, we have to do something. So they stopped production of that until they could fix their device. Well, a lot of those patients then got transferred to Ozipic, which is the diabetes version of that medicine, especially if they had an insurance that covered it without requiring a prior authorization. And so this snowball effect kept happening because there was a stoppage in production of one side of this and all these people that were already on the medicine getting it for $25 a month were getting transferred over when they could. And it just created this snowball effect. So yeah, while the Hollywood people may be a short little pie of why this is, in reality, it really was just a disaster of a start of a drug, and it shows the um, the desire of patients to have a tool to, to help them with weight loss. So yeah, I, I disagree with that, and I disagree with them trying to make it all about the haves and haves nots, because that's not the whole story. Uh, they brought up the idea that if insurance covers weight loss drugs overall, the cost of healthcare will come down. Maybe, uh, but, I think it's just putting off the healthcare cost. Um, and here's my, my reasoning. We have had uh, like gastric bypass around for many years. Gastric bypass essentially can take someone who is diabetic and make them non-diabetic. It cost a whole lot in the beginning, but insurance companies, some of them have been willing to pay for it because of the potential saved healthcare dollars down the, the, the road. Well, what we're finding now is that many people after they go through gastric bypass a couple years afterwards, here comes the weight regain again. And then they start gaining weight and they end up back in the same place they were except for they don't absorb vitamins as well anymore. So while gastric bypass is a tool and it delayed the onset of things, reverse diabetes for a short amount of time, we're seeing a lot of those patients end up right back with it. It's because the body is super smart. All those hormones that help you go into that survival mode and make you want to put away extra so that you can have it in case of famine, they kick back in. It figures out a way to to overcome even physically changing your body. And so that happens in medicines too. I mean, and I'm seeing this, we've been prescribing, I've been prescribing this class of medicines, maybe not Wegovy, for several years now for patients who want that as a tool for their weight loss. But I see many, many times if the core problem, the core reason is not changed and we don't find the right diet, exercise, lifestyle, whatnot, eventually the patient starts gaining weight on the medications. They come off of it, they gain even more weight, and then we're just in this stuck place, similar to where they were before they ever started it. So while meds can be a tool, and yes, they may keep some people from developing diabetes in the short term, long term, I think it's just putting off the healthcare dollars a little bit of time. And so I really felt like this whole time that they were pushing for the meds, thinking almost the idea that the medications would save us and the medications were the end all be all answer for obesity. And that's not the truth. They're a tool, but that's just it. They're a tool. They are not a fix. They are not a, a corrective action. There's something that can help, yes, but they're not gonna save us. Um, and so I feel like that thought process is just way too short sighted for the long run. Um, they started talking about some specific about obesity and what causes obesity and the links and things. And so one of the doctors stated obesity is a disease of the brain. Um, they said that the brain tells us how much to eat and when to eat, how much to store and when to store. And I do agree, the brain it does play a part of that. But what sends the message to the brain to trigger it, to tell it that it's time to eat or not eat, or it's time to store or not store? Well, it's the hormones in the body. And I'm not talking about estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. I'm talking about insulin and ghrelin and leptin and PYY and GLP-1. Oddly enough, these hormones that the medicines themselves act on, you know, the medicines act on that, but those are things made naturally from the body that sends messages to the brain that send feedback and it's all this feedback loop that happens. And so, yes, it is a message from the brain that's telling you that, but it's coming and it's being triggered from the hormones. And so what we eat, when we eat, exercise, stress, sleep, all of that 
contributes to a broken or dysregulated connection between the, the hormones in the brain. And so I think they're putting the cart before the horse kind of thing to say it's a, a completely brain disorder. Um, it, it, the brain plays a role, but the disorder is coming from the hormones, not necessarily just from the brain. They talked about uh, something called set point. And the idea between set point is that your body, once it reaches a certain level, it does everything it can to stay at that level. And if you lose weight, it fights hard against you to get back to there. And yes, I agree with that. I do agree with that 100%. They did say, um, one of the doctors said that it took three to six months to recalibrate the set, the set point. And I would challenge that that is nowhere in research that I'm aware of that it takes three to six months to reset that set point. I have had patients who have lost weight and had to fight like curse words to keep that weight off for years afterwards to reset that set point. There are some people I'm not sure that set point ever resets, that it's always going to be something that they have to constantly work on. And then there's other people that I do think their set point resets in three to six months. But that's not across the board and it's not like, okay, if I can maintain this weight loss for three to six months, I can keep it off because that's my new set point. Mm -mm. It's not that simple and research does not support it. They also um, cited the biggest losers as part of this argument for the set point saying that 96% of biggest losers regain their weight, which is true. Um, but I honestly am not sure that it has anything to do with set point. Um, I hated the biggest loser shows. Um, I did. Yes, it brought light to obesity, but what it did is it took individuals out of their home and put them in a very controlled environment where their food was controlled, their sleep was controlled, they were very controlled, their exercise was controlled, they were exercising for multiple hours a day. And this environment was totally unrealistic for them to try to keep up when they went home. Plus, they had no idea how to keep it up when they went home. No one taught them how to control their hunger or their appetite or what to do when they got stressed or what to do when someone called in the middle of the night with an emergency other than reach for food for comfort. You know, none of that was taught. It didn't address the food addiction. It gave them basically an inpatient treatment for a short amount of time and then said, good luck. Well, of course, they're going to gain all their weight back. There's been nothing there that has helped them figure out how to live life and how to maintain this long term. And it's unrealistic to ask them to exercise for multiple hours in a day. It's just not going to happen. Who can work a full job and exercise, you know, two, three, six hours in a day? No. Plus, they lost their support system the moment they walked out the door. So, and eh, that's my, my rant on Biggest Losers. I don't think the Biggest Loser had anything to do with Set Point. I think it had to do with an unrealistic environment they were put in and then set free in with unrealistic expectations. <clears throat> The interviewer in the show asked if fast food was the cause of obesity, and the doctor that was speaking said that it was a part of the pie, a part of the pie. She actually said, like, a little bitty part of the pie. And I do agree that fast food is not the complete end-all, be-all, the complete reason for obesity. I think it's a little bit more of the pie than just a little part of the pie. Uh, but I also include things in fast food and any type of processed food. So processed food, things that do not look like the animal, the egg, um, the milk, the fruit, the vegetables, they don't look like they came off of the planet or off of the animal, that is a processed food. And these processed foods, or sometimes called Franken foods, their bodies are like, what are you giving me? This is not food. And it's having to break this down, digest it, figure out what to do with it. And those foods are spiking hormones that control our appetite and whether we store body fat or not, way more than those natural foods ever did or could. And even our natural foods were turning into Franken foods by making our fruits bigger and sweeter and carrying more um, sugar. So it is part of the puzzle, bigger part than she said. The other thing is fast food and the food industry in general has no desire to go out of business. So if you are not tempted to buy their food, if you are not addicted to their food, if you don't want their food, then they are no longer making money and they go bankrupt and go out of business. So it is their job to do everything they can to make their food taste as good as it can, hit that addictive center of the brain as much as it can, so you're gonna to want to come back and eat. And not just that, you're going to want to eat more. That's why portion sizes have steadily grown in the fast food industry over the years. Not because food got cheaper, but because they're feeding into that addictive cycle. They're also putting cues. I mean, go to the grocery store and walk down the aisles. You're going to see cues all over the place triggering you to want to eat. And when your brain sees those, all of a sudden those hormones kick back in 
and you have this strong desire to eat that's hard to control. And so I think our food culture in general, fast food and processed foods are a huge piece of this puzzle. Um, I think food addiction is a huge piece of this obesity puzzle and they totally missed an opportunity to bring light to that in this article. All right, couple more things. Hang with me here because these are these are my big ones. And you might say, Amanda, oh my goodness, you've been ranting already, but th these are really big ones for me, okay? So the one of the doctors being interviewed said the number one cause of obesity is genetics. And if you are born to obese parents, you have a 50 to 80% likelihood even with optimal diet, exercise, stress, and sleep of becoming obese. Okay, there are genetic causes of obesity. There are things like palm C deficiency, leptin deficiency, ghrelin deficiency, PYY abnormalities. There's all kinds of, there are true genetic things where the genes have been altered. They are not normal genes and they present themselves as obesity. But they are very rare. They are frequently present from birth or very shortly after birth, and they are very rare. This is a situation in where correlation doesn't equal causation. Just because you see a correlation of obesity happening in families doesn't mean that genetics is the causation. The stat is correct. Um, it is correct that that many people if you are experiencing obesity, likely came from obese parents. But it is due, in my opinion, to epigenetics, which that's a big fancy word, but it's basically your environment, your nutrition, exercise, stress, sleep, environmental toxins, all those things act on your genes to trigger something to happen and induce obesity. So I think we all potentially have the genetic tendency to become obese. That's that evolutional theory of obesity. We all have that um, potential. But I want you to think of the genetic tendency to become obese like a bullet that's loaded in a gun. It is there, it is ready to go off, but there are things in the environment that pull that trigger that induce that obesity to happen. My other thing that I have with this is her statement that even with optimal diet and exercise, stress, and sleep, specifically that, the persons are 50 to 80% more likely to um, develop obesity. So I have to ask, and they didn't go into this, but my question is, what is an optimal diet? What are you calling an optimal diet? Is it a calorie controlled diet? Is it a low fat diet? Because if it is the standard American diet, the Boo Guide Pyramid, that has contributed greatly to our obesity. It has encouraged more processed foods. It has encouraged the processed food makers to make more items and present it as healthy. And all we do is get more unhealthy. And so you can't give kids a diet that is meant for healthy people. That food guide pyramid is meant for healthy, intact people who've never had any troubles. You, you can't expect us to give kids with that genetic tendency, tendency the standard American diet and expect a different outcome than what happened with their parents, but it's not the genes that did it, it's what we did to them. The other thing is, I know zero kids, zero, including my two, that have optimal exercise, stress, and sleep. They feel stress and pressures at school, at home. They are watching screens way more than we ever did 30, 40 years ago. Um, we're not having as much physical education at school. We're not sleeping as much. Our sleep is erratic because it is, you know, happening because of screens and activating the brain. So I know zero kids that have optimal of all of those things. Um, so, yeah, that's my rant about that one. So let's wrap it up. I'm going to read two more statements, and these statements <clears throat> really bothered me. So the doctor said, the biggest misconception is that somehow you, meaning the obese person, can control your weight. Obesity is a disease of the pathways that regulate energy balance, which yes, I agree, the pathways that regulate energy balance, and I agree it's a disease. Ooh, but to say the biggest misconception is that somehow you're able to control your weight. Later on in the interview, she said, the idea that a patient can do it with diet and exercise, meaning that it's absurd 
to think that a patient can control their weight with diet and exercise alone. So here's what I have to say. If obesity is a genetic disease of the brain that no one has control over, we're doomed. We're doomed. We have no potential of coming out of that. There is no medication that is going to save us. There's no situation that's going to save us. We might as well just throw in the towel right now. We're doomed. However, if it is a disease in which improper nutrition over decades, decreased activity levels, high stress, poor sleep, environmental toxins, and etc., have acted on our genes to make them trigger this obesity response, then we have hope. And we have hope because we can do something about each of those. We can daily do something about each of those. We here at this clinic have seen people, and I have seen it in my own life, I have seen it in my family's lives, I have seen it in countless people's lives at this point. I have seen them turn their life around by fixing their nutrition, doing a proper human diet, as Dr. Kim Berry loves to say it, by fixing their stress, by fixing their sleep, and becoming a more active thing, and becoming more aware about the chemicals and toxin things that they're putting in their body. I have seen people turn their lives around and maintain that weight loss. That's not to say it's easy. That's not to say that the same exact plan works for every single person. But just the fact that there are countless examples over decades now of people who've turned their lives around finding the truth about things, it flies in the face of this idea that you are hopeless. So do not let their doubt discourage you. Obesity is not your fault. I really don't think it is. I think there was a multitude of things that went into it. So, um, you know, we were told to eat the wrong things. Our environments changed. Our works changed. Lots of things changed. Obesity is not your fault, but it is your problem if you suffer from it. And we have to figure out how to fix it. In my opinion, that is through proper human nutrition, more movement, working on our stress every single day, even if you don't feel stressed, working on your sleep every single day, even if you think you're getting good quality sleep, and surrounding yourself with a community of people that are going to support you through this lifestyle journey. Whether that is your family, a support group, whether it's us here at the clinic, whether it's an online community that you found that supports you through this life change, that's where the answer is. Medicines can help. Medicines are a tool. People should have access to those 100%. We need to fix that problem in the U.S. 100%. But you have hope and you have the ability to change your life and don't let any news story tell you differently and don't let any news story make you feel in despair and if we can help you with that give us a call we are happy have a good night